Dear listeners, we are not in the white room. We have stepped outside. We are on the street. We have left our safe space and we have ventured out into the real world, which is the world of performance and fiction. I am Simon Bronikowski. I'm an actor from Studio 7 Theater in the little town Schwerte in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany. I am your host in this podcast, The White Room, where I normally speak together with tap dancer Mariah Nee about theater and performance and other related things. Now, this podcast is becoming a peri-pandemic, a peri-pandemic podcast, which means about, around, surrounding the pandemic. As we have to deal with the pandemic, which is not going away, we also have to deal with this podcast, which is also staying, <laughs> by reinventing it and trying out new things. And that's why I'm very happy to having been able to witness and accompany one of the first indoors festivals of independent contemporary theater in Germany to be actually realized and not streamed or just canceled. Um, the, the festival is called Favoriten and was founded by performing artists in Dortmund in 1985. It's one of the oldest festivals dedicated to the independent theater landscape and discourse. It is realized every two years. I've had the delight to see a lot of performances, not nearly all. I've spoken to some performers, not nearly all. So this is a highly subjective take on the festival. In the order of appearance, I speak to Antje Welsinger, choreographer and performer based in Cologne and Hamburg, about her performance Dreams in a Cloudy Space. I speak to Ulrike Seibold, manager of the Regional Association for Independent Performing Arts, North Rhine-Westphalia, which is the host organization of the festival. I speak to Maria Vogt from the performance group KGI about their opera, and now everyone, an opera to Olivia Ebert, one of the artistic directors of the festival, about the festival in general. And I speak to the performer and director Saskia Rudat and her team about their performance Defining Identity. So I hope you enjoy these open field conversations on theater and performance. You can use the chapter markers to skip to the part that interests you most. <laughs> The White Room is a free podcast without advertisement. You can help grow this project by various means. Subscribe to the podcast in your podcast app, recommend it and share it with your friends and peers. Rate it on Apple Podcasts. Send us your critical or praising comments. Support us with money via PayPal or bank transfer. Information is on the website. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram and on Twitter under at whiteroom underscore pod. And now, without further ado, let's begin. Sitting here on the beautiful Favoriten Festival in Dortmund, and um, we're in the beer garden, in the garden, Favoriten Garden, and I'm having a glass of wine, and um, it's quite cold actually. But we're sitting outside; it's still beautiful. I can smoke, <laughs> and I'm very excited because I'm on this festival for this kind of special episode of the White Room, and I have a very nice guest here who decided to uh, make the adventure and speak to me, whom she does not know, and I don't know her, but I have seen a very, very beautiful performance. And uh, so, hello, Antje, Antje Welsinger. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, where do you live? I live in Cologne and in Hamburg. And what do you do? I'm a choreographer and an artistic researcher. Do you work as a freelancer? Or yes. Yeah. And during these times of uh, the pandemic, how did it affect your work? How did you deal with it? <laughs> it's a bit uh, diffi difficult question because um, when the pandemic 
started, uh, I gave birth, so it was I was not really in, in my normal daily working routine. The first time when it really affected me was actually when I, I was speaking to Olivia and Fanti about the festival and when they asked me if I could rearrange the, the piece to the distance of one meter and a half, which I thought, wow, this we, we worked about five months on the piece. And so in the we're beginning, talking about the dreams in a cloudy, in a cloudy space, space, which I just saw. Yes. And they asked you, the head of the festival, they asked you to make a version where the performers should have one meter and a half distance to each other. Yeah, this was in the very beginning yeah, when yeah, they yeah. didn't know at all if the, if the festival can happen or not mm. and everything was still in this kind of not knowing state mm. and in the beginning they they thought that if the festival um, should happen yeah the pe every every uh, piece should have this one meter fifty Distance. Between the performers, yes. and this yeah. was when my yeah, when my child was like six weeks. So it was actually somehow in in end of April, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought, wow, okay, this is really affecting a lot because you work on the on a piece for five months, and then <laughs> you have a couple of days to to rework it, and yeah. And it's also yeah, it's. But at the end, it came out differently, no? Because then the city of Dortmund at the end said no, it, it's okay uh, the, to have duos on stage without the distance. And mm. so, actually, now the piece we we perf just performed, we did it without any um, rearrangements. Yeah, I I, c I could not imagine having seen it with the distance because it's so important. The, the, the piece, the piece that we that that I was uh, that I saw, it was a, a dance between an old body and a young body. You know, it was one part of it. You know, there was a a young performer, a young dancer, a woman, and an older woman who also seemed seemed to be or having been at least a dancer, a performer, and it was a very touching experience. This idea of bringing together an old body and a young body is very intriguing. Seeing them touching each other and manipulating each other in a soft way, in a kind way, was very, very nice. This was one part. So she was the older uh, performer, she was a dancer. Yes, or she, I, I would say she, oh, is, she is a dancer. She is a dancer, of course. Yes, she is, yeah. <laughs> from a totally different generation, mm. also with a different approach to dance, but... Yes. So one part of the performance was that we saw those two performers dance together and uh, do things together, and then there was another thing, a video and uh, a lot of audio mm -hmm. that, that it was in an old people's home, I imagine. We saw, was it two different actresses of performance, or was it one? Because they had the same dresses, or was it various? It was, uh, it, yeah, it was various people. Um, the people in the video were actually no no professional performers, but mm. the whole the whole project started with the interview series I did in, in houses where elderly people live, or also in, in one private uh, home, and I just uh, talked to to people around 90 about how they perceive their body and um, but already with a clear interest because my, my whole interest in the piece was how we can shift perspective on elderly bodies because I observed that in our society when when we speak about bodies that are old we mainly focus on what they cannot do anymore. Mm. And I, I was interested in shifting perspective and like asking them what they can do at the age of ni at, at the age of ninety, uh, and and what is maybe also their potential. And yes, and this interview series I did, and from the interview uh, interview series I, I developed uh, four topics. Oh, I yeah, it was like touch, also uh, border support. Mm -hmm. and pleasure or genuss, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and from these topics 
I, I work with them on a physical level I, uh, and, and, and from this we, we decided to do the, the video so we scripted also the, the whole thing we did with them. It was a very crazy video, it was wonderful to see. It was, uh, they had uh, strange costumes and uh, per perücken, I don't know how it's in English, uh, fakes, wigs, yeah, wigs, uh, and uh, very shiny costume. And uh, they did uh, a lot of beautiful stuff and in the end also a lot of very funny stuff, very surreal, making a bowl of uh, champagne with fruits and placing the fruits on a chess, some, somehow seeming a chess field and playing around and they had uh, some strange these glasses for for going to swim and was it their idea did they want to act like this or how no. did, did you push <laughs> them towards that or yeah when i did the interview series like um i realized that also they they talk a lot about their desire to um to experience something playful and to experience pleasure no, it's actually not true that it was my desire actually, like to, to change, to, to they were in the, the in interest in changing perspective. In the beginning I imagine they were talking about what was lacking maybe, or what was, the, or not? Yes, yes, but the, the yes, and in these interviews the desire came like how to create actually like a circumstance to make them experience their own body in a different way and that is how i came with all these experiments with fruit with uh, with uh, things i did with them in order to facilitate this change of perspective and actually and the the costumes were one one part of um, of this i didn't intend it this effect but when we did it with the wigs and with the shiny costumes it all it also turned out to to give them a bigger freedom to move in in their houses where they move every day but in a totally different um, color and a totally different texture doing different things with objects of everyday life but in a totally different way it uh, it was very interesting because suddenly they, they gained a, a freedom where they could experience a lot of pleasure and a lot of fun and we had like so much yeah so much pleasure together mm. in the end of the of your performance there is a, a phone call that is registered that you are playing from one of the women who is talking to her son maybe I don't know or a relative and she's saying uh, no, I can't talk now. There is this uh, this dancer uh, here, or this young woman, and she wants to make theater with me. So I call you back tonight. <laughs> and, she's, and she's very nice. Yeah, I call you back tonight. So uh, I wonder uh, how long took this process with the, with the people in the elderly home? And um, how did the, the, I don't know, the institution around it react or... How did, did they support this and were they very skeptical? Or <laughs> In the beginning it was super difficult to find institutions to cooperate with because mm. they were afraid. When I said I am an artist and I'm planning a piece with elderly people, they were like, no, we don't have time, we don't have, no, it doesn't work. When I found, uh, finally I found two institutions to cooperate with and then it was, um, yeah, it was a very good experience. They also saw how, yeah, how, how this work affected the people in a, in a very good way. So, um, yeah, they were very thankful also for the project. And time-wise, I did with, in the beginning, I did interviews with 15 people. From the 15 people, I continued to work with four of them. Mm -hmm. And then I met them individually, like to, to work on a physical exploration. And then finally we did, with three of them, we did three days of filming in total, but like split to, um, to certain hours. So. Mm. But the, the other big part was the, was the, the dance of the two performers. Mm. And was this process happening in the same time as no. this? 
Was no, it after? I did, yeah, at first I did the interviews and the video work and then from the interviews I collected these four topics mm. and the four topics were also the starting point for the choreographic process. So I also worked with the dancers from this point but to develop different choreographic material. Mm. So they also, the, 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 the topic of touch for example, the topic of um, hold and being held was very present in the choreographic research. The whole question of um, pleasure, of com how to communicate. Yeah, yeah this is what, I, what I, I noted also, a very unsentimental, pleasurely approach. different approaches. For example, in the second scene where they move the body of the other one, mm. they do it with the intention of people working in these elderly homes and they, they take care yeah. for old people, but not in an emotional way, but in a very pragmatic way. And I use this intention as a choreographic method that they move the body of the other one as just material in a pragmatic way and this also influences very much how they are together whereas in, in one scene later on in the piece we focus really on the touch but on an emotional way of I um, my intention is to really look for the touch and, and to, to search for a really physical and emotional mm. encounter mm. and this produce, produced also totally different choreographic material. So mm. if you take these two duos for example, they, they show two different colors of how two generations can meet and can touch and can be together. Mm. So you, you said to me you had 15 minutes, I don't want to steal a lot, not, not more of your time. I'm wondering what I could ask you last, something, it's difficult to ask, but what is your work about? <laughs> My choreographic work yes. in general, yes. you mean? What is your interest, your, one of your, or your core interests? What is your uh, aim? I don't know how to, how to, how to say it. <laughs> Yeah, at the moment, I mean, this piece is part of a trilogy, which is called um, Bodies of Capitalism. And in mm. this kind of series, I focus on bodies that in a capitalist society play like a strange role. In the last piece, <laughs> I focused on like uh, massive bodies. Here I focused on old bodies and in the next piece I will focus on uh, bodies, um, high performance bodies or the question mm. of uh, Leistung, like... Um, performance. Performance. <laughs> it will... It will <laughs> the working Good performance, title is better. Perform. <laughs> yeah, Perform. Yeah, um, you have to perform. So, actually I'm interested in the body as material to explore social, also social questions. Or as a choreographer, I observe uh, social phenomena in our society, and this I take in the choreographic field. And within the field of choreography, I try to to yeah to explore maybe different ways of dealing with bodies, or like as a proposal, also as a counter-proposal to social mm. phenomena. For example, here with this piece, it's also a critique, like when I, when I observe how our society deals with uh, people of uh, age, I would say yes, it clearly shows that our society has a problem with this kind of uh, becoming less um, performative. Mm. Uh, and then I take this in the choreographic field where I can my access to how we we work with bodies and how we deal with bodies it's it's larger than me as a private person in society so I, I use the choreographic field actually as a f um, space to develop alternative proposals let's say it like this yeah 
and I, I must say that I'm I'm always fascinated by older older performers because somehow their that somehow their physical limits as they have physical limits but somehow they translate into how should I put it they translate into um, more presence sometimes or to a presence which is more precise maybe more um, efficient in a way that they cannot boost their you know, explode their energy like young bodies maybe that have the also maybe a cliche of being active and you know, but uh, ex very expressive so so yeah so thank you very much for thank being you. able to see the performance and for talking to me <laughs> this, uh, in this uh, podcast and yeah thank you <laughs> and I hope you have a performance tomorrow also no we played yesterday and today oh okay so that was it yeah. And did you like it here? Yes, very much. It's a very nice festival, yeah. And I'm really happy, like after all the Corona month, to yeah to be here and to be able to realize an artistic work. It's very, very important. Okay, great. Thank you, Auntie. I'm standing here with Ulrike Seibold Hello. and I ask you, what do you do? In general or here in the moment at the festival? In general. In general. So, I'm working for the NRW Landesbüro Freie Darstellende Künste, um, which is the association um, of independent theatre in North rhine westphalia Yeah, I could translate the Federal Bureau of Independent Performing Arts. Yes, Federal for, Bureau, yes. For, the, for North rhine westphalia I, I always say the association. The association. So the association. Um, is um, together with the city of Dortmund um, the organizer of that festival. Mm. We were just organizing not in the artistic way that uh, did uh, Fanti Baum and Olivia Ebert um, mm. as uh, artistic leaders, but um, we did it uh, the organizing things yeah. behind. And uh, you came in, uh, you took over the job in uh, now in this year. In this year, yes. And you came in in the middle of the Corona pandemic. Really trying really. to organize this festival. Yes, how, how, <laughs> quite you, a big challenge. <laughs> how, how, how did you do that? Oh, with good <laughs> nerves and a very great team. <laughs> so we had to discuss uh, a lot. We had to read all those uh, things about Corona, about the concepts you have to have and discussing and finding good solutions with really a good team. And uh, you also had to, I imagine you had to um, um, negotiate with the town and yes. uh, and how was the response? How was the general? Were they very uh, cooperative or were they very skeptical? No, they were very cooperative and that was um, the only chance to have this festival. Um, the city of Dortmund as well um, as um, the Ministry of Arts um, in, in Düsseldorf. Mm. They helped us a lot. What is a practical day in the, in the, in the bureau, in the association for you looking like? Oh, there is no practical or no normal day, though every day, uh, there's no day which is like the other day. So, um, because on the one hand, um, we are in the direct contact with the artists, and on the other hand, we do kind of lobbying and dealing with all those politicians and people around. Mm. And so it's a very, very um, diverse job. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to describe, but it's it's, it's a cool job. <laughs> so I can I can call you up and talk about, with you about our problems, and then you try to get the informations together and try to kind of develop a political strategy. Yes, that's how what to, we do. How to improve the situation of the independent performers? Yes, that's what mm. we try all the time. Yes. Yeah. And do you see what is the task that you see now? What is the maybe some most more important tasks that you need to achieve? Um, I think at the moment, um, during the pandemic and afterwards, the uh, biggest task is to to get back kind of security, to have the feeling that arts will be funded um, as it had been before. Mm. So because um, all of the artists are quite scared about what happens with the year, mm. and yes, we have to to secure. 
So today is today is the last day of the festival. Yeah. And uh, looking back, how did how did it work? Did it uh, how did it turn out? Oh, did you like it? Did, uh, was I, it, I did liked it, everything it a lot. Works? Everything worked and I think it, we had really, really big luck with the weather because the whole festival has been sunny. We had sunshine yeah. all the time and it was very, very, it wasn't only nice, but it was uh, necessary because um, we had to do all those social things uh, outside because of mm. Corona. And so it worked and we had kind of festival atmosphere which had not been possible if it rained all day. Mm. I think that this it, is it actually the first festival happening. I mean, the first indoor festival of let's say contemporary theater happening in this uh, times in this it's pandemic. It's definitely one of the first. Mm. I wouldn't go wouldn't go so far to know or to say I wouldn't know all those little festivals. Yeah. But it's definitely one um, of the first biggest bigger festivals. Yeah. Was there ever the decision or the idea to make it like an online event or something? No. no. Uh, to do an online event, that was never the idea. That was never um, what the artistic um, what uh, the artistic leaders wanted. Mm. But um, we were thinking about many other plans, uh, plan Bs. Mm. So about having it at another time or having it in different places or something like that. But never only on online. Right. So, okay, I think um, after all this crazy time, maybe I will visit you in your office someday and uh, yes. speak with you a little bit more about the normal world. After this pandemic, no, there is still a lot of problems going on and we have to work towards, towards sure. a better future. And, so, sure. and you're a great part of it, so thank you. <laughs> sure, looking forward to meet you, thank you. Thank you, Ulrike, and I'm going to see the show now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Okay, so I'm speaking now to Maria Vogt, who... who ah, yeah, uh, in English, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, who took the adventure of speaking to me. We met once, I think, I don't know when, uh, one year. Uh, before this corona, everything seems like centuries ago. So, yeah. <laughs> in some time in the, in the past, we met for a conference and now we're here. And um, yeah, you're, you should introduce yourself somehow. You're part of KGI, K-G-I. Yeah. A performance group or theater group or... Maybe you can tell something about it. Yeah, we are three persons and yeah, we do theater plays for about seven years, yeah, I guess. And we, we were educated at the <laughs> schools that are well known in Germany, like Gießen, mm -hmm. Angewandte Theaterwissenschaften, don't know what it means in English. Applied Theater Science. Applied Theater Science. Theater Studies. Applied Theater, theater Studies. studies. Mm -hmm. Und uh, the Ernst Busch School. Hmm. Yeah, in Berlin. In Berlin. And um, I'm on the HFPK, Hochschule für Bildende Künste, in Hamburg. And yeah, we had the, at one point we had the strong uh, wish to work with non-professionals because we are always sit surrounded f in our place from yeah from professionals uh, yeah whatever Theater that means whatever that means <laughs> theater scientists and yeah we yeah we were a little bit bored of the bubble and mm -hmm. we were we were yeah we did uh, some political works. And we noticed that it is really important to get in touch with people who experience stuff. Um, experience stuff. Yeah, experience <laughs> stuff. That 
people who can that can talk about the things that we are wondering about, thinking about, discussing about, people that have, yeah, that are excluded from the science and art circle, mm. people who have to work hard and and work in ugly, boring jobs and be confronted with uh, yeah, ugly labor and mm. um, yeah, being out of labor. So you settled in, where are you situated now? Now we are in Bochum. Yes. And um, yeah, we moved to Bochum because we work together with the Ringlockschuppen in Mülheim. And yeah, it became, and we, we were living in Hamburg before and Hamburg is so expensive. And uh, yeah, for a couple of artists with um, a child, there's no place, so we were uh, we were victims of the gentrifications, mm -hmm. <laughs> gentrification, and then we moved to Bochum because there is a, there is the possibility to live. You can you can pay the rent. Mm. There are fl free flats and people who are daring to <laughs> let people in their flat who are not uh, teachers or mm -hmm. lawyers mm -hmm. or doctors. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So we found a place here. Yeah, and I think. And the people, the non the group of non-professional people, which uh, what we are working there, of course, living here, and so yeah, and it is a lot of work beyond the theater work, a lot of work um, staying in touch, um, yeah, helping in some daily life situations, mm -hmm. and so it was necessary to be here. Mm. Yeah, it was very strange to get on the train and say, okay, see us in four months or so. Mm -hmm. It's better to be placed here. So you created or you somehow started this group with non-professional actors or yeah. performers, but uh, you work with them professionally in the sense that you, they, you work hard with them yeah. and you pay them, I, I think, I yeah. imagine, and I heard of before. Yeah, we pay them. Theater projects with non-professionals. This is very usual. A lot mm. of people do it, but they use them at, as as um, I don't know authentic material. Mm -hmm. And after the work, <laughs> you say goodbye and have a nice life. And but the point is that most of the people that experience being on stage, uh, they would they dream about doing it for the living. Mm -hmm. And. Yeah, it is. It is a. It is a very loud secret that all these non-professional performers, all this uh, authentic material that is seen on stages, is actually dreaming of being an artist. Mm. And so we dare to make promises mm. <laughs> and said, "Yeah, okay, we do the next project with you, and we try hard to get the funding to pay everyone." Mm. So yeah, but yeah, yeah, I think it's. It's not a 
everlasting project because I think lives are moving on, people mm. getting pregnant, moving, mm -hmm. moving away. And so, yeah, I don't know in which direction it will develop in the future. Mm. And now at this festival, I, 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 we just, I just came out of your performance and it was an opera actually and I found it wonderful because in this podcast uh, we had an episode some uh, weeks ago with an opera singer and we were speaking a lot about singing and about the voice and blah 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 and then we were also speaking about the opera scene and she explained she she explained to us how awkward how strange this uh, opera world is and I had the question like why is there not an like an opera independent opera movement Like there has been maybe in the theater world, no, which was created maybe, yeah, I don't know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, started to be independent groups and, but in opera, I, I uh, somehow, I, I think, I don't know, maybe it's a prejudice, but I think there is, it's still a very big system and so now I witnessed a kind of an independent opera with, yeah, untrained singers. Yeah. which uh, I liked very much because it was like a, like a mixture between uh, Kurt Weil, Richard Wagner, Samuel Beckett <laughs> and uh, uh, old Greek drama and uh, yeah. so, so how did you yeah how did you get to this idea or how was the process of working of developing it yeah I think the idea was actually the old idea the, the idea to 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 try to do something that is actually not uh, not in the system. Like, you are not allowed to be a non-professional opera sing singer. Mm -hmm. This doesn't exist. And um, But uh, we, we, we know our perform performers very well and we know that they are able to, to stand the vulnera vul vulnerability. <laughs> vulnerability. Um, <laughs> that you have when you sing. was the decision that we say okay we believe in their capability of this vulnerability vulnerability yeah. <laughs> and, and and we we are very interested in this let them sing let them be proud of singing let them yeah express through singing let them express with an imagine imagination of being an opera singer mm. and dare to be something that you are not mm. and dare to be something that nobody believes that it can exist and so we were very yeah <laughs> interested in this but it is after we did this after we made this experience we we yeah we have to yeah say that it is there are reasons that this uh, scene doesn't exist mm -hmm. because opera needs a lot of things that a uh, free scene cannot really deliver mm -hmm. so easily and like what like for example you have to have a good monitoring for the director mm -hmm. uh, for the con, con uh, 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 how is it called conductor uh, conductor for the conductor yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> for the conductor and yeah this is um, one one point the other point is that you have a lot of rehearsals mm. and yeah and we we did our work in in uh, cooperation with Musiktheater im Revier in mm. Gelsenkirchen and there we had all the structures yeah we had this huge electronic system everything was there perf perfect sound um, equipment thousands of people doing their work being paid And now we try to make, uh, uh, yeah, we try to tour with this work, and yeah, we have to admit that it is not, it is not possible. Mm -hmm. It is really, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, it is difficult. 
because if you if you say yeah we do it we do do a great opera with um, non-professionals then yeah you have to establish an opera house mm -hmm. everywhere you go <laughs> when you have <laughs> when you're touring and yeah this is kind of crazy mm -hmm. and yeah and the people the non-professionals they get used to the surrounding where they had their premiere mm -hmm. and if you're touring as we did today then you notice that it is very hard to be strong and to be proud of what you're doing when you when you're insecure at the same mm -hmm. time because mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of time to rehearse yeah. in the space and yeah you don't have a ti have time to rehearse in the space and mm -hmm. everything is different yeah. and so so yeah it's difficult <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah but I think the the people really, if you if you just uh, look isolated at their performance, there is the proof that it actually should be uh, uh, a scene of non-professional opera mm -hmm. uh, pr productions. Yeah, but I think there have to be some structural changes because of uh, in the, in like funding cha changes in the funding systems. Mm. Yeah, because if actually, if you want to really fit in the system, you have to do small productions with professionals who are very flexible. And yeah, and this is not the thing that we did. So, I'm sitting here with Olivia Ebert. Uh, we're just uh, this afternoon and it's, uh, a show is about to begin and I could uh, steal some of the uh, precious time of, of you as being the artistic, one of the artistic directors of this festival. It's, I'm, I'm very glad about that. I'm very honored. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so, um, where do you live? Uh, that's a tricky question. At mm. the moment, um, I somehow live in Dortmund because I spend most of the time here. Mm. But um, my home base is in, in Frankfurt, Frankfurt am Main. Yeah. And I'm kind of uh, traveling. Or I, before the festival started, I was traveling back and forth because I also worked in other cities. Uh, being also a freelancer, mm -hmm. there were several projects. <laughs> yeah, that would be my next question. What do you do in Frankfurt, in Dortmund? 
Um, yeah, the the last uh, the last uh, one two years, or even before, um, I yeah I, I started to work freelance in in the context of um, yeah festivals, um, curation, mm. um, dramaturgy, and um, the Favoriten Festival. Fanti and I, Fanti Baum and I, we we already. Um, uh, we're programming last edition in 2018, and um, this is kind of this was also for for 2019-20. Now preparing this edition was my main project, but I also had um, a work in Mannheim. There was a little curation I did for Mannheim, and yeah, that's it mainly. But it is kind of uh, yeah, as many freelancers know. <laughs> Uh, sometimes um, uh, the the traveling is uh, is uh, also part of your daily practice <laughs> because of the distances uh, between the working places. Yeah, you surely must have uh, reached a level of efficiency in your packing of stuff. Uh, or so what, what do you need? What do I really need? No, on a yes. trip. What do I don't need? What do yeah, I don't need and. Yeah, sometimes it's very efficient and sometimes not. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you miss something, which is in the other city. But for the festival now, I, I was um, bringing a lot of um, uh, yeah important things I need, so I'm prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the Favoriten Festival actually? What kind of a festival is it? Yeah, the Fav Favoriten Festival is um, a quite old festival it was it's one of the oldest festivals in germany for the freelance scene it's a platform for performing art scene in north rhine westphalia and it happens every two years and um, it was founded in the 80s by by artists in dortmund and that's why it's still in dortmund mm -hmm. and um, the city of dortmund is hosting it partly and um, the Landesbüro für freie darstellende Künste, which is which the is independent. Um, I like to call it our lobby organization. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> it, it's the lobby organization for uh, theater makers, performing mm. arts, uh, dance makers in North Rhine Westphalia. So the the main uh, the main mission or the main task of the festival is to present what happened in the last one and a half two years um, to present a selection of uh, guest performances mm -hmm. uh, produced in, in North Rhine Westphalia. And uh, the Favoriten Festival was not always called Favoriten Festival, no? Yes, um, when it was founded it was called Theaterzwang, mm. the obligation to, obligation go to go to the theater. Obligation for theater, something like this. Yes, yeah. and it's a saying, or it was inspired by a saying of uh, Karl Valentin mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, 2008 it was renamed into the Favoriten which is also not our favorite title for it's the not festival. your favorite title <laughs> no because it's um, um, Fanti and I we tried um, not to see it as a best of festival because we we not we we are not uh, thinking that we really can present or if any that anybody can choose the very very best you know it's um yeah it's always a subjective or mm. selection it, it has to do something which which interests us and how this is um uh communicating with the with the scene or with what what happens in the scene and it's um we don't believe in this best of uh idea anymore we don't mm. think this is uh, um yeah we don't want to judge about uh all the shows in that way that mm. we have only this quality criteria it's more that uh, we try to uh, that's why we also had a topic and an open call this year you had a topic yes, which uh, was for the first time i think or, or last yeah. year last time for uh, two years ago there was no topic yeah two years ago Maybe it was, was kind topic. of a hidden topic there we also tried to describe our interests and we did this um, again 
Last, in 2008, it was mainly, um, it was a very wide topic, it, but it was mainly the interest how uh, you could, um, um, yeah, when you think about category, categories and definitions, how you could escape them or how mm -hmm. you could aesthetically or also politically um, cross um, certain category me mechanisms. Mm -hmm. One hidden topic was also ohne Auftrag, without any mandate. mandate. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it was more about, um, maybe more about aesthet an aesthetic interest also. Mm -hmm. How you, uh, how we ask ourselves how to find a political moment, such as, uh, yeah, negation of categories in form, mm. in, in, just um, not only as a as a topic of the evening or of the show or not only the daily politics but in the aesthetics in the form in the mm -hmm. way to work etc mm. and um, we also when we made the open call last time we also described this interest we yeah. tried to and this time uh, the same but uh, this time it was more a clear topic the topic work so where many people have an idea to Mm -hmm. Working conditions, uh, what is um, meant, was what is understand as uh, work or labor, and um, yeah, in specific, we were interested in finding all the um, fields um, in society um, where work is not paid, or or mm -hmm. to see the the other side of paid labor. Of course, thinking also about labor conditions, but also. Um, trying to to see political work to see um feminism for example um, um movements society movements in society as work on society this mm. is one of the angles we try to look onto the topic also to to see yeah what work is done in society for society which is not paid at all or which is not seen at all and on the other hand how um, the the status of a certain job you have or when you don't have a job mm. how this is really the main the main cate category the people look on you or the main um, aspect that people judge on you mm. uh, in our society we think and so this all the all the programming was around these fields um um, not about um, the first thought you have in mind when you think about work, but all the other mm. fields around. Yeah. The, the, the title of the festival is While We Are Working. Yes. And then in bracket, in parentheses, at. No? Yeah, this was so the um, uh, German um, short term for shortening for Arbeitstitel. Working ah, title. Working title. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't get that. You know, I thought while we are working at. Ah, yeah. While yeah. we are working at what? <laughs> was a, yeah, was but a, this is also why the the why we are working. The title um, we also like very much because it's um, it's um, it's about a process. Like why we are working. It's mm. um, it's not something um, finished. It's uh, yeah. It's the topic of a process, of an artistic process as well. And also it is something you could, you miss or you, there is another world around us while we are working. So mm -hmm. it's not only about work, <laughs> mm. like it has um, these two pages for us. Also very, we talked a lot, of course, due to, to um, especially due to Corona and the crisis in the independent art scene, on our working conditions and um, this was also a very important topic for us in the preparation also if it's not where it's not so represented in the artistic work but for the way we try to to prepare this festival it was very important for us for example to um, fight for Ausfallgagen yeah because the festival, let's say that uh, there was the danger also that the festival could be cancelled. Yes. You know, because at the moment all the big events are cancelled. And uh, you, you fought for that uh, if you had to cancel the festival or certain shows, that the artists who have been contracted 
should be should get a, a fee. Yes. A kind of a compensation. Compensation. Sixty like percent at fee. least. Of exactly. Their, of their salary, like like they do for the companies. People cannot work because of the conditions, and they get a salary paid by the state. Exactly. Sixty percent. And it's not. Um, yeah, usually um, in the freelance scene, um, the contracts are very weak, so the you don't have any rights if you are sick uh, as an artist. If you, I don't know, you 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 just get not any money out yeah. of it. So it's always on the side of the artist that uh, he or she, out of whatever reason the project was cancelled, is the one who is in the in the bad position. Yeah. The, and. Um, we really tried then to 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 speak with all the responsible persons because we are only the artistic direction and there are other persons involved from the city of Dortmund but also from the NRW Landesbüro mm. how to formulate the contracts in a way that it is safe mm. that the artists get the 60 percent in a case of cancellation and then we were also going deep into the details we had to go into the details because um, um, in, in case of cancellation, it's, um, sometimes it's also important who cancels. Mm -hmm. Is it because of uh, the general situation gets really so bad that mm -hmm. everything has to be cancelled and it's kind of uh, uh, clear? Or is it because maybe some regulations get um, stricter and then we don't know how to present this artistic work anymore because it's not possible to mm -hmm. present it? So these are then some details we discussed and also um, it was very important for us to s not s only to see the artists but also all the technicians who are mm. working for the festival. For example at the Ruhrtriennale nobody got anything after yeah. cancellation. It was, it's really embarrassing for, um, for all responsible <laughs> persons in charge there. Um, now I think it, it, there was some compensation, compensation but mm. uh, in the beginning, it, it looked like nothing. And um, yeah, we had a lot of discussions with our technical director and the technical team. And we also figured out and invented ways how to also for them to guarantee something. Mm -hmm. Because usually a technician is paid after the work. Mm -hmm. So he even he or she even doesn't get a contract yeah. at all. But it is just a job, you know, and then you write your invoice afterwards. Yeah. So all these things were very present. Yeah. Um, and they have become present because the topic, your topic was decided maybe very early, no? Yeah, yeah. You had it one year one ago. One and a half years One and a half years you decided the topic work. Yeah. And then the situation crashes on us and yeah. you're really forced to, to think about and to work on work on how to deal with the work, with the contracts. With yeah. And, and I think um, this is something which... Yeah, it's very important to Fanti and me and all the team, but also to the artists that we are in, that we are inviting to work on these working conditions mm. in the in this field, in this independent arts field, to improve the conditions for everybody, to um, be um, more aware um, on um, yeah energy levels, <laughs> work levels, like how to how how to balance it, how to re what has to be done to restructure the um, um, the funding system, for example. So uh, because when you you know it probably yourself, like all the premiers are in autumn because there's only one deadline in the year, <laughs> you know, all these mechanisms. Yeah. And we talk a lot about this. And, um, and do you see any any um, progress in that with the, in these topics with the, I mean, with the political authorities, no, who make yeah. the rules? Yeah, I think something which has developed in the last years um, is that more applications are interested in process. Like this is something. At the moment, we are still in this very production-based system so that you have to apply each year for at least one project to survive, one new project idea, mm -hmm. because it's always about um, describing something new, developing something new. And it's um, most of the shows are only presented twice or three times and you're kind of lucky when you are <laughs> when you can present it more often. Yeah, yeah. This is really strange and feels uh, wrong. Yeah. And um, some... Um, did react to that so that there are some more residencies or research programs in the last years. But I think it's, it still has to be pushed more and more.
that um, we get out of this. This is also very neoliberal, neoliberal that we uh, that we we think uh, of uh, only something new can be good. Mm. But and then it's it's it feels really wasted somehow. There is so much um, creativity, energy mm. in one production, mm. and so much also yeah effort and love, and then it's gone somehow very very soon. And mm. it, it could be also an aim to to work on that that more people um, get the chance to see it, that it has some time to develop as mm. a piece yeah. and so on. Grow. Yeah. Or, and also to invent funding that is independent from the production itself, yeah. like for infrastructure and for yeah. research. Yeah. Yeah. In the last episode of my podcast, of our podcast, we were talking about uh, giving birth to a performance, because we could say that the performance is kind of a child who's born and then also should have the time, a little bit of time, to grow up. No. It's finished and it's born for the first in the first performance. Then it should have some time to develop to grow up to learn maybe new things yeah. to change a little bit yeah it's nice so. image <laughs> nice metaphor <laughs> yeah somehow it's also something favoriten is for because yeah. it's one of the few opportunities for for some of the invited artists to to make uh, um, another um, performance like uh, like uh, to show it again to yeah. to um, oh. yeah to yeah, otherwise it's really, it's, uh, some of them are, were only shown twice or mm. three times. Yeah. It's a pity. So now we have to go to see the next performance. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, just the last question. Next favorite will be in two years. Do you know any, is it then, are you going to be, to, to do it again or? It will be, um, a new artistic direction. Mm -hmm. It will be, um, an open call again. I think in the end of the year, mm. so people can apply. So whoever <laughs> listens, you can apply. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is something. It's not so often as well. So I, yeah. I think it's very. It's great that that it's an open call for yeah. the artistic direction, and it's also good that it uh, changes and uh, mm. that it's not one person or one team for the next ten years. Mm. Mm. Good. So thank you, Olivia, for speaking to me. Yeah, let's go and see the next show. I'm sitting together with three nice people and uh, one of them is Saskia Rudat, I know. Uh, but the others, you have to tell me your name again. I'm Jan Wittmer, good evening. I'm Jakob Lorenz. Nice. And, um, you have worked together on a performance which I just saw. And um, how to start? I really don't know how to start because I have a lot of questions somehow, but I, have, I don't feel intelligent enough to <laughs> be able to formulate them. <laughs> um, so I, I, maybe I will just start with some banal questions. So, uh, so like, where do you live, Zaskia, or you, and also, where, where do you live? Uh, I live in Cologne at the moment. Mm. Yes, but it's uh, I'd say it's m more like a base mm. where I live, but and I work. I also work in Cologne, but I also work um, all over the district of NRV. I work in Essen and uh, in Düsseldorf a lot. Mm. And um, Bonn and other places, and also, I'm always happy to tour and perform in other um, cities or other countries as well. And what do you do? You say you perform. Okay, so what what do you do? Um, I am a theatre maker and a performer, and um, I work uh, in the field of uh, physical theatre and. Um, and non-physical theatre, <laughs> uh, but also um, I perform also a lot in dance festivals, and sometimes I work as a teacher as well. 
um, but mostly or what I what I prefer preferably do is making art like creating pieces myself that I perform and what do you do um, so I'm working as a composer mostly in so theater pieces so I'm coming more from the contemporary music but yeah after I finished um, the music school I'm I'm trying to get more into the performance scene and I'm living in Cologne as well Köln Mülheim mm, Mülheim yes I'm uh, living in uh, Mülheim too uh, actually we're neighbors and um, I work as a light technician uh, and uh, Field te te technician in general at a, a dance theater in Cologne that's called uh, Tanzfaktur. Um, yeah, and I think my main job is making theater possible. Heuristics. In psychology, heuristics are simple, efficient rules which people often use to form intuitive judgments. They are mental shortcuts that usually involve focusing on one aspect of a complex problem and ignoring others. In the early 1970s, studies by psychologist Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman set in motion the Heuristics and Biases Research Program, which studied how people make real-world judgments and why those judgments are often unreliable. This research challenged the idea that human beings are rational actors. Yeah, so um, examples that employ heuristics include, among other things, using a rule of thumb, an intuitive judgment, stereotyping, or common sense. Common sense is sound practical judgment concerning everyday matters, or a basic ability to perceive, understand, and judge that is shared by or common to nearly all people. Maybe I, I want to ask some questions or to um, also to reflect upon your performance from the spectator's view, because I was a spectator and uh, what uh, what was going on. So um, the first uh, uh, the first thing that uh, that. Um, uh, happened, let's say, happened to me was that I was uh, surprised. And it was not only once that I was surprised, I was surprised a lot of times. And I think that this is a very good sign. So I enjoyed the performance very much. It was, uh, sometimes it was very hard also, uh, the topic. And um, I think sometimes spectators want to govern the performance. So they, they, they always think ahead, no? They pr you are presented the situation and uh, you always think one step ahead then the, i think the art sometimes is to to go into a different direction and to to actually yeah to surprise and uh, this can maybe result in a kind of a yeah thought process or um or some experience and uh, i had this uh, so this is i'm very grateful for that <laughs> thank you <laughs> and, it's nice to hear yeah Let's start with the title, uh, because I can't remember the title. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it's, it's, your performance is called Defining Identity, but yeah. then there is a lot of things more, and I don't get them. So maybe, <laughs> what was the title again of the performance? Well, the, 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 the performance is called Defining Identity. This mm. is the way you speak it. Yeah. But in the written word, um, the letter I of identity... Um, is is switched so um, written is is very hard to describe I will write it <laughs> down it's, for you it's a, um, mm. so the idea behind this is that it's a piece about gender and it's a piece about gender identity and um, the, the title is a part of a joke that appears in the piece as well which is that um that we categorize people very much by their genitalia. So, um, so I developed a system of um, symbols, how to how to have a typo typography of uh, genitalia that can be written. 
Mm -hmm. because then there's the suggestion to call people by their genitalia. So we don't say Mr. Da -da -da or Mrs. Da -da -da, but we say like Vulva, uh, da -da -da, Vulva Schmidt or Vulva Smith or uh, Penis Smith or mm -hmm. Intersex uh, Smith. Mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, of course, a joke because uh, it, it's, it just shows how ridiculous it is to, to categorize people only yeah. on the basis of their genitalia. So the title is, um, is a typography of genitalia with, that is constructed by different symbols. Mm. So you get identity, 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 but the I is always... Uh, switched to a symbol that symbols a certain or references a, a certain type of genitalia. Mm. Stereotypes. A stereotype is a fixed, overgeneralized belief about a particular group or class of people. Cardwell, 1996. The use of stereotypes is a simplification of our social world. Since they reduce the amount of processing, for example thinking, we have to do when we meet a new person. By stereotyping we infer that a person has a whole range of characteristics and abilities that we assume all members of that group have. That leads to social categorization, which is one of the reasons for prejudice attitudes, for example them and us mentality which leads to in-groups and out-groups. Stereotypes make us ignore differences between individuals. Therefore, we think things about people that might not be true. And this actually describes very well also what was happening to me as a spectator. Because and this is now, it's, I'm really almost afraid to, 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 to speak about it. No, but don't be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will not be. I will be very, I try to be <laughs> frank and... Uh, so the first thing that I saw was, uh, was I, I, of course, I don't know you personally, no? Yes. I, I also, I, I think I saw some things on Facebook or whatever, so, mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, interesting, interestingly, I, I could never guess, are you a man or a woman, no? Mm -hmm. So I don't care. But then uh, you appeared on stage and obviously, and this was so um, uh, surprising to me and also shocking somehow that I was fixated on uh, how you appeared and that you uh, that you from the from the um, how do you say from the appearance mm -hmm. did not have breasts and did have a penis no so yes. and i and as a spectator i was fix i i was looking at it and i was trying to an analyze no something inside me you know, was see, was looking at this and really fixed my eyes were fixed i was saying i uh, ah yeah okay i okay and then maybe i understood okay maybe it's uh, man or i don't know okay let's say let's just keep it in in some no suspension yes okay i'm okay now i'm okay <laughs> gender stereotypes gender stereotypes are simplistic generalizations about the gender attributes differences and roles of individuals and or groups Stereotypes can be positive or negative but they rarely communicate accurate information about others Many people recognize the dangers of gender stereotyping, yet continue to make these types of generalizations. Both female and male stereotypes can be harmful. They can stifle individual expression and creativity, as well as hinder personal and professional growth. The weight of scientific evidence demonstrates that children learn gender stereotypes from adults. Socializing agents like parents, teachers, peers, religious leaders, and the media pass along gender stereotypes from one generation to the next. I was very struck that I as a spectator was uh, forced to, to kind of uh, uh, look at this and, and also look at me at the same time mm -hmm. being so fixed, fixated yes. on, this, on this topic. So uh, you mean that your, your, your own mind is thinking so much about what what biological body that is on stage yeah, and you kind of watch yourself reflecting while you're watching the performance yeah reflecting about what i am yes exactly and kind of trying to this is what 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 i say the spectator wants to govern trying to understand it to to be to kind of um 
um, even it, no, and to say, okay, this is that, identify, no, mm -hmm. to yes. identify it. Yes. And then, yeah, and, and in the first half of the performance, then maybe, okay, I could somehow, yeah, maybe identify it like this. And, but then it changed completely mm -hmm. and it surprised me again. So from the masculine character, if we could call it, it was mm -hmm. a, it was not, it w had still a kind of an adro androgynous, mm -hmm. androgynous. Uh, androgynous aspect. But then it changed and it became from the masculine, it became something in between. Mm -hmm. and, and then it became uh, totally the, if you could say, the opposite, no? The fem female character. Yes. And, um, and this was another shock. Prototype psychology. In psychology, prototype refers to what is perceived to be a complete image of something with all expected qualities and characteristics present. In cognitive science, prototype theory refers to graded categorization, where some members of a category are more central or more perfect than others. This means that although some things may belong to a certain category of elements, they still may be perceived as unequal. An example of this unequality is chicken in birds category. Most people will regard pigeons as a good example of a birds category. Pigeons are more prototypical of a bird than chicken. Although everyone knows that chicken is a bird, for some reason it has a less privileged status than other birds. Chicken is viewed as less of a bird by many. If you feel more empathy now for the chicken than you would feel for a man in a skirt. The shock was not that this was happening, let's say, because what I liked also was that it was that you, that in fact, you were not naked. No. no? You were not completely naked. And there, uh, and what was shocking me was not the nakedness or a naked body, what, but it was. Um, my own um, my own um, perception my own conflict let's mm -hmm. say of yes. trying to perceive trying to understand this prototyping helps us organize and interpret vast information we receive from the outside world on the other hand it may sometimes block new information and force us to focus on our pre-existing ideas making us less open and flexible needless to say prototypes can contribute to prejudice based on race ethnicity social status gender and And uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I talked a lot, but uh, no, it's yeah. very interesting. Oh, it's very interesting. Yes. Um, so um, yeah, is this in any way? I I don't know. Is this in any way describing something that you that you wanted to achieve or that you absolutely? <laughs> yes. That's the whole point of it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Well, yeah. I I started the the piece with. I mean, I had a lot of goals, and this is just one of, of many things that I I was working on. But very in the very beginning, I really asked myself how how is it possible to um, to to become a man, like realistically look like I'm a man, and um, to fool people that don't know me, that they truly believe I'm biologically male. And then, and then to achieve that, on 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 one side, definitely try to achieve also like a, a connection to being male and to the struggles that come with being male and to the also oppression and and um, everything that you have to fulfill in a certain gender. Um, so I don't become like a woman that is making a piece about gender and men just feel completely underrepresented and you know I don't I mean I also say it in the piece I don't dislike men <laughs> so um, so I thought like the best way is to, to start as a man um, Yeah, and and I was actually surprised how how much fun it was, but also how simple it was to 
to achieve that and it does work um, on a lot of people and um, especially if they don't know me but even if they know me they some people say that they um, even if they know that I'm a, a woman biologically that they forget or that they get fooled and that they get really um, also I had this uh, from a teacher that saw the piece and she said that that she was really shocked how much she was thinking about whether I'm a woman or a man yeah. and how much effort she took to like try to find out and yeah. then in the end she was quite embarrassed that that it was so important to her to know if I'm a woman or a man and, mm. and then she was like well why why did I want to know I mean I can also just see a human being and mm. why is it that important you know gender binary the term gender binary describes the system in which a society splits its members into one of two sets of gender roles gender identity and attributes based on the shape of genitalia in the case of people born with organs that fall outside of the system, intersex people, enforcement of the binary often includes coercive surgical gender reassignment. Gender roles are a major aspect of the gender binary. Gender roles shape and constrain people's lives experiences, impacting aspects of self-expression ranging from clothing choices to occupation. Traditional gender roles continue to be enforced by the media, religion, mainstream education, political and other cultural and social systems. Sometimes in this binary model, sex, gender and sexuality are assumed to be default to align. For example, when a male is born, gender binarism assumes the male will be masculine in appearance, character traits and behavior, including having a heterosexual attraction to females. According to Thomas Keith in Masculinities in Contemporary American Culture, the long-standing cultural assumption that male-female dualities are natural and immutable partly explains the persistence of systems of patriarchy and male privilege in modern society. From a formal perspective, coming again back to the surprises, mm -hmm. from, let's say from a formal perspective, I, I, I like it very much because I think that uh, it's our duty somehow again back to the, the spectator wants to govern the performance from an let's say entertainment point of view. Mm -hmm. It is very entertaining to be surprised. No? Yes. It's very entertaining and also very somehow awakening a little bit in the attention if you can't guess or if you if you can't guess the next move it's mm -hmm. a, it's a very nice play and it it makes a very uh, lively performance and this is what i admire very much and this is what i like very much about performances this is it's something um i always think back of oscar wilde i think he said there is no moral or unmoral uh, uh, novel mm -hmm. there's only good and bad novels mm -hmm. in that sense it's 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 important for me and also from this in this podcast to 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 identify identify <laughs> <laughs> to to speak about the also some things that maybe are on the formal level um interesting for the spectator and what makes a performance alive mm -hmm. and what was very much making it alive for me was this constant um suspension of my attention because I did not really know in which direction would it go. Let's say gender, would it go in the male direction or a female or a, or a something in between? And also the color, let's say, was it, it was, there were very hard parts and then there were very soft parts also to it. And they were changing um, even also without really noticing, I mean, me, no? And um, yeah, maybe I, I I I would like to ask about about the work of the lights okay. at this moment, just to 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 know about the process of you. How 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 was the process for you develop developing this piece, and what you how you make how you make how you try to make with the lights also some this performance possible. What what is your idea behind it? Or I don't know how to. Well, the general idea is um, at, at first, well, with this work is um, that we, in every scene or with every character, we wanted to um, bring out um, 
Well, we and, wanted and, to and, and Stimmung is an atmosphere. Yeah. It's very much about atmospheres, and the light is is supporting that greatly. Yeah, and that was the that was the main idea to 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 bring these atmospheres um, to the characters, and um, we were working with uh, uh, at a very low level of light, lights uh, with um, very few lights mm. and um, uh, yeah that's that's basically uh, the idea sure there were um, uh, some uh, there was some very interesting coloring uh, that we used to bring out for example one specific character which is like the embodiment of white male privilege to give him this chocolate atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of poetic <laughs> uh, in the first part no yes mm -hmm. so in, the, in the first part this was also he had a big shadow there was a play of shadows also i i, I remember uh yeah that's um uh, that's a cowboy it's a, it's the cow cowboy. yeah i was yes. thinking the same okay. cowboy there's yeah. also a lot of references in the light yeah. like yeah. we I mean, I play a lot with with stereotypes, but I think I don't I don't act them like stereotypes. Like I add a depth to every character, or I don't I take every character seriously. But for example, the shadow, there's like a really cold light, and we really worked on this. And it's really cool. Yeah. It's just it's just this cool character. And we worked on this like like somebody is alone on a street corner kind of atmosphere. For example. Mm -hmm. So you immediately like the light goes on, and I have a certain costume and a certain physicality, and from that immediately like people see all the advertisements or the movies where this kind of guy is the main guy you yeah. know so and then i i have to i have to inter interject something that you played with the cigarettes no and it's of course it's this I, i have to admit i could identify with this because i also tried this no to put out the cigarettes in this cool way boom, boom, boom. but it does not work Never, it never works. <laughs> Not like to, to, yeah, to, uh, the to cigarette snap box, the box and then the box one cigarette and then pops out. Pops out yeah. and it's yes. just perfect. And I can I can tell as a smoker as well, you have to practice this a lot. <laughs> you have to really practice it a lot. So uh, And nobody does it and just makes a fool of himself. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there was also exactly this kind of the male character in the in the beginning, the cowboy or whatever was it there afterwards. It, it was it was full of little failures also no trying to put on the costume and then it somehow does not work and and um, so this was very funny also <laughs> no. yes so so the lightning is a very like the music and the lightning they're both um, I think very like very forward with what they do like it's it has they have very clear um tasks to fulfill the music and the lightning they have to support very much but they're very simple at the same time um, and especially the lightning there's a lot of light um situations where there's just like one light or just two and it's a very big switch in like um in, with the colors or with we also have this LED lights in the back that just like change the situation really like change the situation and the atmosphere like from from one moment to the next drastically mm. and this is of course is also possible without but it's not nearly as catchy or not nearly as powerful um, yeah and also like visual and auditive and sensual you know? mm. like it makes i think the the sound and the lightning that make the piece very very sensual because you like really go on a on a very big journey with all the light in your eyes and all the different colors and the different atmospheres and all the different sound atmospheres and the audio is coming from four 
um, places, so it's it's around the audience. Um, so and that's also a very uh, a unique experience for the spectator. Mm. Yeah. Also, the, the in the first half of the performance, the character was mute. No, he did not. He or she, or in between, did not speak. There were, but there was a lot of text, a lot of words, a lot of very interesting text coming from the speakers. Dysphoria from Greek, dysphoros, difficult and hard to think of, and is a profound state of unease or dissatisfaction. In a psychiatric context, dysphoria may accompany depression, anxiety or agitation. It can also refer to a state of not being comfortable in one's current body, particularly in the case of gender dysphoria. Common reactions to dysphoria include emotional distress. The opposite state of mind is known as Euphoria. In psychiatry, it is an intense state of distress and unease increases the risk of suicide as well as being unpleasant in themselves. I remember very much this uh, a long, let's say, discourse lecture about, which was very interesting about, how could I say, about all the science and all the research and all the effort being made to research um gender and the problem and the problem of identification and and everything which is behind also the problem with uh, not being not feeling comfortable in, in in your own body and all this and then there was a long discourse where you had a a very different costume on a kind of a second skin And uh, one could not guess even what, what it was, what kind of um, character that was. And then behind this discourse, there was a voice always coming back. I, I, I only want to end this or something. Mm -hmm. It says, no, I just want it to stop. I just mm -hmm. want it to stop. Yeah. Gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is discomfort, unhappiness or distress due to one's gender or physical sex. The current edition DSM-5 of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders uses the term gender dysphoria, where it previously referred to gender identity disorder, making it clear that they no longer consider the gender identity to be disordered, but rather the emotional state of distress which results from the gender identity. Gender dysphoria can include the size of your shoulders, hands, feet, hips, butt, waist, your muscles, your fat, your body height, your body hair, your chest, your genitals, your the face. <laughs> And I was wondering if it was my voice <laughs> telling to this discourse because I, in some moment I could not follow anymore. Yes. It was just too much information, It's a lot. too much, too much of research that I, as a white male, maybe also am not pushed towards understanding or trying to, 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 um, to, to go in deep into the subject because it, it does not affect me. Mm -hmm. No? Um, in my normal life but it, and it, therefore it was a lot of new information and more and more and more coming and in the moment I thought this voice was was also me as a spectator saying it please just stop this this discourse I cannot understand it anymore yes. but at the same time I was wondering if it was also a discourse of 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 the character or of the, of the play saying that also that it should end somehow Mm -hmm. Well, it's. I mean, it's definitely not uh, not meant in a suicidal way. To yeah, be very okay. clear about this, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's. I I love this uh, scene because it's it's very ambiguous. It's um, it's very beautiful in a way. I think, and it's very important, but it's also very annoying and very hard, and <laughs> it's just impossible to to understand everything and to stay connected and it's just very very it also some people say it hurts to mm -hmm. to sit there and watch and listen and and in my opinion I, I studied psychology and I love um, science and I love definitions and 
all the text that is coming is about how stereotypes work and how categorization works and what is dysphoria and what are prototypes and all of that which is very very much connected to labels and to how we see people and it's a very human thing to put people in boxes because our brain does that mm. because otherwise we couldn't mm. filter all the information we get like a healthy brain categorizes it's very normal mm. but at the same time um, it's very painful to to be also to be talked about like like you are something that that can be just like scientifically um, yeah looked at and mm -hmm. and also I sometimes hate this distance that science has on things mm -hmm. that it's just like okay well categories work like this and <laughs> prototypes work like this and there's no connection to what that means in real life and I am very fed up by being categorized every fucking day you know and this is where I like it that that it it's actually something good to understand what stereotypes are and what categories are and also to understand what kind of um, identities there are out in the world and what kind of different uh, types of how people identify themselves and different sexualities and everything but also it's like sometimes just like give me a break you know <laughs> can't we just like be people and not worry about all of this no. so um, I think for me it's very much also like a, I'm torn sometimes a bit between I think people should be more educated and I also think we should just like let it go you know and mm. I don't want to talk about it anymore I don't want to have it present anymore so um, I think this scene catches this duality very well mm. for me personally but do you think that there is a let's say a, a life beyond this struggle that there is a kind of a solution that Non-binary. Non-binary people are people who do not identify as exclusively masculine or feminine. The discrimination of non-binary individuals is a form of sexism, as well as a specific type of transphobia. I mean, I think that, that people do, especially like with a piece like this, I had a lot of interesting conversations with spectators afterwards, and I think people get more sensitive on this issue. And I, but I also think you never reach everybody, and there's so many people out there that are not, not even ready maybe to, to let certain things in, also, or to think about things or to throw things away that they have been holding on for a long time, and which is which is okay and what I respect. But I think it's very much possible to find um, environments where people are where you are so this is what what was really my personal rescue maybe in a way that um, that I felt like okay there are spaces where I can have friends and partners and family and the people that I deal with every day not the people in the train or in the U-Bahn or not the people like where I buy my broccoli but The people that I care about, you know, you you can find uh, spaces where this doesn't matter and where people actually see you as a person and mm. see you as you and they don't care, you know, mm. and all that sexism and uh, homophobia and transphobia and that uh, people think, oh, you're so different, that um, there's spaces where people are not like that. I think that's important. Yeah. And of, I, of course, I hope that this will grow, you know, like this little safe bubbles, bubbles of mm. people that there will be like over time more and more people that that the bubbles will be bigger and then they start touching each other and then the area, it becomes areas of 
safer environments or environments where you can be more comfortable in. I'm optimistic with that. Limitations. Socialist Judith Norber states that we often find more significant within group differences than between group differences for the gender categories male and female. Norber argues that this corroborates the fact that gender binary is arbitrary and leads to false expectations of both men and women. Instead, there is growing support for the possibility of utilizing additional categories that compare people without prior assumptions about who is like whom. By allowing for a more fluid approach to gender, people will be able to better identify themselves however they choose. I sometimes think that it only reaches also people that are somehow already thinking about this or somehow being open to it. I, for myself, for instance, I, ca I, can, uh, I can tell that, let's say this, this banal thing or this basic, not banal, this basic thing, this uh, thing of gendering the language no mm -hmm. for, for example i have to explain now that it's very different in german be, maybe than in english because in german we have uh, different genders that also in the plural sense um, somehow define it in the there. pronouns in exactly. the endings it's a lot it's a lot easier in english to have a gender neutral Exactly. language than in other languages. In German. And in German we, we uh, somehow invented uh, a, f a, f a form to, to, to integrate this, uh, these different um, genders into the language no? mm -hmm. with, a, with, a, with a certain form, uh, also written and also spoken. No? I of course learned about that, I had to learn about that. No? And uh, in the beginning, maybe I was like, Ooh, I don't know. It's a comp you also say it in the piece. It's so complicated or whatever. It's uh, no. And uh, but more and more, I kind of let go of this, of this unnecessary uh, resistance, maybe, and just use it. Also, mm. try to use it. Try to be aware of it. And um, more and more, uh, I think that it shapes also really. Uh, the not way the, you yeah, think of the it. way I yes. think, or maybe the possibility to put myself also in the shoes of somebody else, no? mm -hmm. which is a basic, I mean, I don't know, a basic social need. thing, <laughs> a basic <laughs> social thing, yeah, which is so so difficult. It's almost it takes a yeah, lot of effort. I had a, gr a great conversation with my sister because my sister has a two year old child. Mm. And there's this part in the piece where I say, well, can't we just see p see kids as kids? Yeah. Why does it have to be boys and girls from the beginning on? Can't we just see children? Mm. And she started actually to to think like that and to see like just the kids like kids. And also when when she talks to her child, she says like, oh, there's another child or there's another kid and. And she really also described this, that it shaped the way she, she views children. That I don't know, there's like something is like soaking and then it's disappearing. You know what I mean? Like um, the, the walls come down a little bit in some areas. Yeah, and I, th I, I get the impression that more and more people do this, that they um, <coughs> get this information from from pieces like this or from science and uh, even the authorities do it or try to implicate it in, in all the written stuff they put out and um, that's the beginning there's so much uh, uh, <coughs> there's so much more to do of course there's always people who resist against it uh, but it's not a change that happens overnight and I, like I already said, I'm optimistic about this change, especially the younger generation is very much more aware of these problems. And um, I don't want to say we just have to wait. No. Uh, that would be wrong. Um, but we are not the only people who do this kind of work. Yes. So. It's very visible in this festival also. <laughs> And I think uh, we're on the right way as a society. And I do, I do want to add that 
I think it's important to try. I don't think it's. I think it's very difficult, especially in German, or even even worse in uh, languages like Spanish or French, where there's even more gendered words. Um, but I think it's the important thing is not to always gender correctly or always yeah. always integrate everyone. But the important thing is to try and to like to. Um, um, to embrace the concept mm. of there's other people included as well, mm. yeah. you know, and there's nothing wrong with just using the female version mm. for once, and then another time using the male version, mm. and then one time using like the all inclusive version, or yeah. sometimes like, like, um, like making a list, <laughs> you know, mm. and, and saying like welcome you and you and you and you and sometimes just saying oh. hello everybody mm -hmm. you know it's just about i think the important thing is to try and to 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 work on this awareness of yes. mm. because this is the thing that shapes the language shapes the thinking and this is the the, the thinking part is important mm. maybe more important than the language part yeah. A stereotype threat arises when one is in a situation where one has the fear of doing something that would inadvertently confirm a negative stereotype. It is cued by the more recognition that a negative group stereotype could apply to you in a given situation. It is important to understand that the person may experience a threat even if he or she does not believe the stereotype. Simply in the context, the person perceives that the stereotype is a plausible categorization of himself or herself by others. Steele and Aronson, 1995. I think there is the word tolerance of ambiguity, no? Mm -hmm. That uh, somehow is. Maybe there is a, dan a danger of everything, of every uh, effort to, to that it becomes also pedantic, like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. no, this is now the rule and you have to obey it or something. But uh, I think, mm, yeah, that, as you say, it is. Uh, it maybe it's open. It opens also up space for playfulness, no, for t for taking, for. Um, um, for not let the thinking stop <laughs> and uh, uh, crystallize into some form or whatever, but leave it fluid somehow. I don't know if 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 it's if one can understand this. <laughs> yeah, and I think for people like me that are not not gender normal or not heterosexual, it's important to sometimes feel hey, somebody is thinking about me as mm -hmm. well, and. For me, this is important also, that people know you exist, you know, um, and, and also for people to understand that these little things, you know, that like if someone asks you, do you have a boyfriend, you know, like these little things that there's not even the possibility in their mind that there could be anything else in my life than mm -hmm. a boyfriend, you mm -hmm. know. Um, that is painful. Mm. And this is why this is why it's important for me, I think, also to like, to show also other people that like I'm I'm integrating I'm I'm not just thinking of two people, I'm thinking of everybody or I'm you know. This word um, uh, tolerance of ambiguity I have from a, from a book of a of a um, scient uh, how do you say Islam Islam scientist mm -hmm. uh, or Islam or a professor of Islam studies mm -hmm. Thomas Bauer and he wrote about Islam mm -hmm. and uh, but telling a different story of Islam t telling a story of how Islam became through the contact with the Western colonization mm -hmm. a dogmatic they had or or they formed dogmatic branches of islam which now are very present mm -hmm. in the world like mm -hmm. wahhabi islam like saudi arabia or something mm -hmm. but that i don't know in the uh, medieval times our european medieval times mm -hmm. which in islam uh, region in the was a very very prosperous time and a very scientific time there was a lot of 
playfulness in 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 if you if you think that that there is a that there at the same time exists the the Quran and everything that Muhammad said and at the same time there exists one uh, thousand and one nights which is a very erotic kind of a tale where a woman is the protagonist Sherazade who who tells stories to prevent uh, her own death and who kind of wins at the end no? mm -hmm. and to and that he explains in this in this in this in this book that it's that it was never about pinning uh, putting it down to one right thing but to have a like a multiplicity of of op of opinions or of 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 uh, interpretations that could exist at the same time yes that is uh, That is that is a very crucial point because I think a lot of people are afraid that something is taken away from them when other people get representation as well. Mm -hmm. And as you said already, it's not it's the same mechanisms in every form of suppression if it's women, if it's non straight people, if it's people of color, if it's people with disabilities. If it's children, if it's old people, it doesn't matter. It's always the same if it's religions, ethnicities. It's always the same mechanisms. And I think there's a big fear that that something is lost when other people are seen as well. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a very crucial question how this can like what what can be done against that feeling of fear that uh, if somebody else is integrated or represented or someone else is heard as well or seen as well um, that it doesn't mean that 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 the people that are most present now do not have space anymore you know that they will still also be there <laughs> and also be seen still mm. you know so uh, more is more. More diversity is more diversity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. Nothing yeah. more to add. <laughs> no, nothing more to add. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank it's a you. very Thanks. interesting conversation. Yeah, uh, I'm just following the flow. The flow. Somehow, I hope. I don't know. If somebody listens, then... I at least I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. 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 That's the power of the podcast. Genus Angel.